So here on The Vinyl Guide, we're always talking to musicians and music makers and folks that are in the industry. Uh, and today I'm very pleased to welcome Steve Polt. He's a songsmith, a troubadour, a balladeer, a poet, uh, and uh, a storyteller, a muso, uh, a conveyor of emotion, a, a vehicle for the zeitgeist. And uh, you may not know him from uh, his name, but his work is, uh, I'm sure everybody here knows the different songs he's written. Uh, and I want to introduce you to him because I think he's a really remarkable guy and very talented as well. And uh, after this uh, podcast, I think you'll never forget Steve Poltz. How are you doing, Steve? Good. It's just funny to hear you introduce me because I was on the radio once and it was a morning show and the guy said, Steve Poltz is coming on. And people thought he said, Steel Pulse. <laughs> and so he said my name twice. I was Steve Poltz. And I guess people weren't listening, and they showed up at my show, but they were reggae fans. Mm. So I walked out on stage, and I'm just like this skinny white guy, and people were so bummed when I walked out on stage. Like, <laughs> So I tried to do my songs with a reggae beat. Yeah. Like, it wasn't totally working. No. So for some reason, I just had a flashback. <laughs> How quickly could you do a, sw a, a, a switch around? It was, it? it was hard to do. Yeah. I tried. I did, did you win them best. over? Some of them. Yeah. Some walked out. Okay. <laughs> After they paid, though. I don't know. One time I opened for Styx. Mm. Remember Styx? Which, like, uh, so it would be the Styx with or without James Young? James, Dennis DeYoung. Dennis DeYoung. Oh, yeah, the front, the head guy. Was yeah, it with it, or without them? It was without him. Okay, all right. So what it was was they had a huge falling out. So mm. he, Dennis DeYoung would travel as the voice of Styx. Tommy Shaw was still in Styx. Mm -hmm. So they had these other guys to sing. <laughs> and so... Dennis DeYoung can only travel as the voice of Styx, whereas Styx got to keep the name, mm -hmm. and they hate Dennis, and Dennis hates them. Right. So my booking agent was like, hey, you want to open for Styx? And I had an off night, and I was like, yeah. That's how it is, <laughs> mm. you know, in the folk world. Sure. Got to sure. take the gigs. They were like, we'll give you like 200 bucks. And so it was in a place called Jacksonville, Oregon, mm -hmm. which is like a tertiary sea market. Mm. Like, it's not even Jacksonville, Florida. Jacksonville, Oregon. Right, yeah. And that's at a place called the Brit Pavilion, B-R-I-T-T. -T. Okay. Now, at the Brit Pavilion... That sounds like a pub. Doesn't it? Yeah. But it's a pavilion. It's like a shed, outdoor show. Okay. So at the Brit Pavilion, people will line up, and then when they open the doors, they run in because it's festival seating, and just to get the best seats. So you see, like, 200-pound freaking <laughs> overweight people, like 200 pounds overweight like diabetics and stuff running to get seats, like people collapsing on the ground and diabetic coma, somebody having a heart attack, another person having a stroke, and they get just to get their seats to see sticks. So I'm not listed anywhere on the tickets. All it says is sticks presented by this classic rock station that plays all the classic rock mm -hmm. songs. So the DJ comes out and he goes, Hey, everybody, I'm Wild Tony from the Morning Zoo Show here on KMMF. And he goes, so great to have you here tonight. I'll be so excited to see Sticks. And the place is going nuts. He goes, Domo Arigato. And they go, Mr. Roboto. He goes, come sail away. And they go, with me. Come sail away. Come sail away with me. And then, lady. And then the crowd goes, when I'm with you, I'm smiling. He goes, it's going to be the greatest show. Are you ready? Are you ready to rock? Yeah. And they're going nuts. And he goes, but first, please put your hands together for Steve Poltz. And it was the sound of one hand clapping as I walked out. And there were three girls there to see me wearing my T-shirts. The shirt you're wearing, actually. Oh, okay, yeah. And all three of them stand up. And that's all you hear amongst 3,000 people in an outdoor amphitheater. And people are giving them dirty looks, free and cheering for me. So I play the show. And afterwards, I, I go, hey, I'll be at the merch stand if you guys want to come by. And I'm trying to win over a sticks crowd, right, with solo guy and acoustic guitar. I'm doing everything but performing in blackface. Like, hello, my, my baby. Hello, my darling. Hello, my ragtime girl. Swanee. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. Like anything to win them over. I just Please felt, like me. Yeah, I felt terrible about myself when it ended. Like, <laughs> I was just patronizing, doing anything I could. Just they wouldn't throw things at me. So I go over to the merch den, and this guy comes up, and he's got a fanny pack on, which in Australia is what mm. you call a, just a... A lame packer. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a thing you wear. Yeah. I know a fanny. A belly is a bag or whatever. Pussy here. Mm. So, uh, but it's a belly bag. Yeah. yeah. So he's wearing a fanny pack and he's waiting in line. Not that there was a huge line, by the way. Mm. Like he's waiting. He's the third person of three mm -hmm. people yeah. to get CDs. <laughs> and 
he's got a mullet haircut and he's drinking a Bud Light in a koozie. And he gets really close to me. He's got Bud Light and garlic fry breath because they're selling garlic fries. Mm-hmm. And he goes, hey, man, I just want to say, and he goes to shake my hand. And I've always been scared when people come up to me if I don't know who they are because I saw this movie called The Candidate with starring uh, Robert Redford mm. where he's like, it was a 70s movie. And this guy walks up, hands him a Coke and a hot dog and then punches him in the face. <laughs> Robert Redford, okay. he punches him. So I'm always a little scared and I have a bit of trepidation. So this guy comes up and he goes, hey, I just want to say, when you came out on stage, I hated you. He goes, and then when you started playing your first song, I really fucking hated you. He goes, and by the time you got to your second song, I hated you even more. I didn't think I could hate anybody so much. (laughs) And then he goes, I looked over at my wife, and she goes, I kind of like him. And that made me hate you even more. And then by your fourth or fifth song, my wife really liked you. And then since she liked you, I started going, hey, maybe this guy's not so bad. He goes, and by your last song, I was like, this guy's okay. I think I'm going to buy a CD. So I'm here to buy a CD. It was like it took so long for that to come out for him to say one positive thing that I was already so beaten down. I felt like I'd been through my own EST program. And he finally bought the CD and left. And I just felt horrible about myself. And that man is now your manager. Yes, he's here right now. <laughs> Johnny! <laughs> Bubba! Come here, Bubba! Cletus! It's hot dog time. <laughs> yeah, and the other funny thing I remember is they had all these Marshall Stack amps, like yeah. 30 high, mm-hmm. and I went to lift one of them, and there was nothing in them. Okay. And it was the quietest stage volume. They all had in-ear monitors. I go, what are these? They go, oh, these are just fake. They just travel with them. They're totally light. We can lift five of them at a time. Five Marshall Stacks at a time onto the truck, and it's all fake for show. Mm-hmm. And the keyboard player was on a what I call a Lazy Susan. Like, it spun all the way around, like okay. on a table, so yep. you could get the condiments you want. And he was playing the piano behind his back, and he was wearing a fanny pack and had a mullet and was flicking its tongue in the air and actually had a cold sore on his lip. <laughs> so anyways, let's start this thing. <laughs> that was a good start. That was a yeah, great intro. Now, uh, is that your worst uh, uh, opening story? I think it is. Yeah. yeah. It ranks up there. There was okay. a, a couple other bad ones. Mm-hmm. But that one's for... That one, you get your bang for the buck. Sure, sure. But look, that sounds like... Uh, overall, it's not too bad. You must play, I want to say, 200, 250 dates a year. Yeah. Is that right? Easy. Cru- cruising around the world. You know, you've been doing this now for a couple of decades now. You you, you really you spend more time off uh, outside your house than you do inside. Yeah, I, st- I quit my job in 1992. That's the last job you've ever had. What was my it? My last job. I was a nipple salesman. A nipple. Uh, now, what is the job of a nipple salesman? Well, a nipple is a threaded piece of PVC pipe or steel, but mm. we ours were PVC nipples, and you screw a sprinkler head on it. And mm. so I sold them to irrigation contractors who would put in people's lawns and mm-hmm. maybe uh, you know avocado fields and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. For trees, and so you would sell nipples like what a hundred at a time to these irrigation companies. Yeah, to the contractors, to mm-hmm. the distributors. So I had all these distributors, and I would go to trade shows. This was my college job because mm-hmm. I, I had a degree in political science with a minor in Spanish. Okay, so which is the gateway to a nipple sales? It's great training. Yeah, <laughs> it's like if you want to work in Silicon Valley, you know, you study certain things. If you want to get in the nipple business, yeah, Spanish minor. <laughs> and uh, political science. Now, how would you make your, your nipple pitch in Spanish? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Donde está el baño? <laughs> ¿Tienes tacos? Rolled tacos con guacamole? <laughs> I think you need to go to rem- remedial Spanish. <laughs> I do. So, okay, so you grew up in Southern California. Which part? I grew up, we moved from Canada to Pasadena, 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 mm-hmm. California. Mm-hmm. And then my formative years were spent in Palm Springs, California. Uh, what was it like in Palm Springs? Hot, mm-hmm. hot. I'm talking like Queensland hot, mm-hmm. but without the humidity, it was a dry heat. Mm-hmm. So like 120 degree days in the summer, which is like, I guess like 45. Yeah, Something 45. Like yeah, yeah. Yeah, 45 degrees. Mm-hmm. Screaming 45 <laughs> degrees. Now, now Palm Springs is kind of the playground for a lot of the, the Hollywood folks. You ever see, like, uh, Sinatra? I or, met Sinatra. Or, you met Sinatra. Okay. Yeah, shook his hand. Uh, the guy that lived across the street from us ran the airport. So he told us whenever anybody came in, um, Cher, Sonny and Cher. Mm. One day I just went to, I would go to the spa to work out. I was running cross country, and Cher would work out there, and I'd 
run next to her and mm. lift weights next to her and stuff. That was pretty cool. Yeah. And then Elvis Presley met Elvis. You met Elvis. Yeah. Tell me about that. He, uh, the guy that ran the airport called us and said that he'd be uh, landing on a pli- private plane. He goes, hey, Steve and Kath, my sister Kath, he said, Elvis will be landing at 3 p.m. on a private plane, and you guys can meet him if you'd like. And I freaked out because out of everybody, I was the biggest Elvis Presley How fan. old were you at this point? It was 1969. I was nine years old. Right. And so he was like the Richard Nixon drug advisor and stuff. Mm. He was he was comeback special Elvis. Oh, Okay. You know, he was looking cape, good. Cape wearing. He was in, point? when he landed, the plane landed, and it was 120 degrees that day. Mm. You could see the heat rising off of the tarmac, and they let us ride our bikes on the tarmac. Like, <laughs> obviously, it was pre-9-11. <laughs> yeah. We were wearing burkas and everything. They didn't care. <laughs> so, <laughs> they didn't even search your turban. No. <laughs> okay. so, so we ride our bikes on the tarmac and then the plane lands and the steps came down we're just watching and elvis presley stepped out and we were about 200 feet away from him and he just stood and looked at us just me and my sister so we laid our bikes down we didn't know what to do and he didn't come anywhere near us but he waited for us to come to him without taking a step forward so it was looking like at unspoken us. like you're coming to me yeah he had this charisma right. so we ran full speed and I just jumped up into his arms, and he picked me up and put me on his shoulders, Elvis did. And I had a baseball cap on, and he's like, what's that? I go, Palm Springs Tramway, that's the baseball team, Little League team I play for. Took my hat off and put it on his head and ran his fingers through my hair and messed my hair all up, mm-hmm. set me down. And then my sister already had boobs. She was older than me, so he hugged her for what seemed like – it was weird. I just remember it was like a longer hug. <laughs> like, I got spun around on his shoulders, but he hugged her. Yeah. And – uh then I remember I, for, I couldn't think of anything to say, so I said, it's okay, Elvis, you could have her. <laughs> so he started laughing, and he goes, your sister sure is pretty. And then uh, he just talked to us. You don't know how close that was, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and Priscilla and everything. Yeah. <laughs> so you hung out with Elvis, you talked to him for a while. And yeah, okay. and then finally one of his assistants came up and said, come on, boss, we got to go. Mm-hmm. And then he got into a black limousine, a really long stretch black limo. And as it pulled away, it got smaller and smaller. He actually rolled down the back window and hung his head out of the window and kept waving to us. Hmm. Like, it was one of the coolest things ever. He did not quit waving to us. Like, he was so giving. Yeah. And until the limo just, like, disappeared, you know, into a mirage. And we rode our bikes home that night, kind of high on the trail of success. And That's like a movie scene. Ah, uh, it was beautiful. Wow. The day he, I met him. Do you think he was high? Of course. <laughs> yeah, he gave me some drugs. <laughs> I was only nine. <laughs> here you go, little boy. Here, I want you to try one Sounds of Sounds like you kids have been running. Yeah, I got, a, I got a new bag from Dr. Nick here. Why don't you take <laughs> some of this? Um, so you grew up in, uh, in Palm Springs, uh, and then at what point did you realize music was going to be a part of your life? When I joined uh, Madrigals and Folk Mass in the Catholic Church. Mm. So I sang in the church choir. And then I joined Madrigals when I was in ninth grade. And Madrigals was like the top singing group. I was in concert choir, which was like 100 kids. But Madrigals was like the top, I guess, like 12 singers, Mm. guys and girls. And you would learn all these really intense songs in other languages, like... Fauna canzone senza notteneri. Fauna canzone senza notteneri. Oh, like the Latin Catholic yeah. song? Okay. Si, my bramasti la mia grazia veri. We would compete against other schools. Mm-hmm. So it was the top singing group. And um, it was about that time that I got on the wrestling team, too. So I could never tell people on the wrestling team that I was in madrigals. It was like I had a secret life mm-hmm. as a madrigal. Because just the name, the madrigals, and we'd wear these robes and travel kind of mystical kind of yeah it was yes you know for lack of a better term super gay Mm. you know the kind of gay where you get your butt kicked right yeah especially in that town so you don't tell anyone you're from but but you you had a connection to the music you felt something through the music Mm -hmm. it it may not have been was it spiritual or was it just i was a natural from the time i was six i saw julian bream play classical guitar Mm -hmm. i got taken to his concert at the hollywood bowl by my gay uncle louis Mm -hmm. and then Louis knew what he was doing. He said, what do you want to learn, piano, banjo, or classical guitar? After I'd just seen Julian Bream. Mm. I said, I want to learn classical guitar. So I learned classical guitar. So I had already been playing guitar since I was six mm. and singing. Um, and my uncle would bring boyfriends home, like at Christmas time, 
whoever he was dating, and I would do songs uh, mm -hmm. like from Oliver and Fiddler on the Roof. He would dress me up as Oliver, okay. and I would sing the songs. He would put on these musicals, and he was very theatrical. He, mm. he died a couple years ago. I loved him so much. And so I always had the music in my soul. Mm. And then I was on the wrestling team, like I said, and then was playing, and I just kept singing and was always in the choir groups and then, you know, mm. played in some bands. And mm. So, but you started with like musicals. Musicals. And then you graduate, like at, at some point, uh, what was the, your, your entry point into more popular music, rock or well, folk? I got really into Barbara Streisand and Liza Minnelli because my uncle was into them. Mm. So my uncle would take me to Barbara Streisand movies like um, What's Up, we Doc? Were. Yeah, The Way yeah. We Were. What's Up, Doc? On a clear day, you could see forever. So I was really into, on a clear day, you can see forever. Mm. And then I got really into Liza Minnelli because my parents and my uncle took me to see Cabaret when it came out. Mm -hmm. And I was a huge fan of Joel Grey. Mm. He was the guy who did the MC in the movie Cabaret. Okay. Welcome, I'm Pianfanu. Welcome, and that was a great film. So I loved Liza Minnelli, and then I got into Neil Diamond, um, Hot August Night, mm. and so I'd go over to friends' houses, and they were into like um, Black Sabbath and stuff, mm -hmm. and they would put on the records, and it, I hated it. It was so noisy to me, and I'd go, mm. "Can we listen to some Barbara Streisand?" And they would want to just like beat me up. <laughs> And then I got really into Jesus Christ Superstar. I lived with that. That record changed my life because that was kind of had rock. It was a rock opera. Mm -hmm. And I learned all the parts. Jesus, Judas, Mary. Mm -hmm. Like I would act out the parts. I would rub lotion on my own feet like I was Mary mm -hmm. and then betray myself as Judas. Mm -hmm. Like I knew everything. <laughs> and if you know what I'm talking about, betraying myself, then we're on the same page, babe. <laughs> So, <laughs> back to that Elvis story. Uh, um, so, uh, okay, so you 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 appreciated the, uh, the the rock, but you wanted the sophistication. I the did story, and yeah, you weren't satisfied with just a very loose verse chorus. It was verse. too noisy. Yeah, and then I discovered the Beatles. Mm. Got really into Revolver. And got really into Rubber Soul, and then got really into uh, the White Album. Blew my mind. Mm -hmm. That opened my head up. I wasn't into Sgt. Pepper's, but I got really into Magical Mystery Tour. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite records to this day by the Beatles for some reason. What's your favorite Beatles song? Flying. It's an instrumental off of Magical Mystery Tour. Yeah. I just love it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Something in the Way She Moves, mm. George Harrison. I think it's one of the most beautiful songs ever written. I love that song. Oh, and Taxman because of the solo in it. Let me tell you okay. how. That solo is insane. That's Paul McCartney, actually. Yeah, it is, solo. Paul yeah. on the solo. But you like the George uh, compositions. I like the George compositions. I love George Harrison. I was in New Zealand on tour with Jewel, and George. we would always stay in nice hotels. And I was walking, and coming in from the pool area was a guy... And he was walking towards me, and it was a glass door, and I'm walking that way. And I just go, oh, that's cool. That guy looks like George Harrison. That's neat. Look at him. And then as I open the door, he goes, oh, no, you first. And I go, that is George Harrison. Mm. And I just went, and I go, hi, George. And he goes, hello. And he walked by me, and that was it. <laughs> He didn't, didn't put you on his, his hand. He didn't put you on his shoulders. And no, sing your... <laughs> he just said hello. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. That's great. Yeah. Is that the only Beatle you've ever met? Yeah, I didn't even really meet him, but I, oh, I did. I talked him. to yeah, him. You did talk to him. Yeah. You exchanged acknowledgement. Yeah, and it was cool that I met um, Liberace. Mm. He was one of my favorites too. I liked the dramatic flair, and mm -hmm. so we would, uh, you know, we we're really big in the states on uh, Halloween and trick-or-treating, where you go to people's houses and you say, trick-or-treat, and then they give you gifts. Well, we'd go to Liberace's house because he lived not that far from us, mm -hmm. and we would trick-or-treat at his house, and he, Liberace loved Halloween, and he was dating his chauffeur, the blonde guy, mm. and Liberace would have on boas and like rings on all his fingers, and he'd wear makeup, his hair was perfect, and he'd open the door and he'd go, hello kids, have a Snickers bar. <laughs> and then we would leave, and we, I would change from being a ghost to being Batman, so I'd be somebody different and come back to get another one, because he'd hand out full big Snickers he bars. He gave out the good, he was the good uh, house on the block. Yeah, and, skimp. 
it was amazing. And another thing I remember is the steps leading up to his house were piano keys, mm. black and white keys, like a piano. However, they were like as if Lewis and Carol did them, and they were all swirly. Mm. And with cactus by him, because it was Palm Springs, right. and the piano keys leading up to his house. It was really <laughs> neat. And then when you rang his doorbell, it was like a... a Box song or something, right? Like, yeah. da, 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 or sorry, not that's the Godfather, but you know, it was like, da, 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 yeah. da, 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 da. hello, kids. <laughs> you mean, of course, bar. it's got to have this song. Yeah, on there, yeah. So you start playing in bands uh, after yeah. high school, right? Yeah, and you start forming. Was it then you formed the Rugburns? Yes, I okay. did. What happened was I got really into the the musical called Godspell. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that one? Mm. A familiar uh, of it, but not I lived with it. it. Yeah, like okay. it was another record I lived with. Okay, after that, I got really into Bob Dylan. Mm. I discovered Blonde on Blonde. That's what turned me on to Bob Dylan. The album okay. Blonde on Blonde. My my other uncle left it at the house, and I lived with it, mm -hmm. and that blew my mind to open. Mm. So, you know, to, when I heard him say, "Whoa, Mama, could this really be the end to be stuck inside a mobile with the Memphis?" blues again it was amazing mm. and so then I got out and I went to college then I started a band called the Rugburns mm. and that's where we started rocking okay so you started rocking you started playing the different clubs um, and then you were part of a an ensemble or several different bands that would play these clubs together yeah yeah, what happened was my sister got a job as a DJ on a college radio station mm -hmm. at San Diego State, and the station was called KCR, the mm -hmm. Live Wire, mm -hmm. college radio. So I would go, and they'd have these booths where you get vinyl records, and you could sit and listen to them with headphones. They'd have listening booths mm -hmm. back in the day. This is in 1979. Mm -hmm. And so you'd go, and you'd check out records. So I would just look at the different records, and I remember I discovered this record called Rastaman Vibrations, Bob Marley and the Whalers. Mm -hmm. And I just flipped, listened to that, and I would just start experimenting. Well, my sister was on college radio, and that's when punk rock started happening. So I was really into Jackson Brown by then. Mm -hmm. And then I got really into Pink Floyd, The Wall. Maybe it was 1980, I don't know, mm -hmm. whenever that okay. record came out. And then she said, turn this stuff off, listen to this, and handed me a record by a band called The Dickies, handed me Sex Pistols, handed me Elvis Costello, um, Joe Jackson, all this stuff was starting to come out. Mm -hmm. in was the it 80s. still noise to you, or no? It was awesome, mm. and by then I really got it. Mm. And although I always liked Elvis Costello because he had smart lyrics, I liked the funny stuff too, like the Dead Milkman and stuff mm -hmm. like that, more than the Dead Kennedys. I didn't right. like to hear people scream and be too angry. Mm -hmm. I liked music that had quirky. You didn't want the political message. You didn't want the heavy-handedness. Yeah. Right. I didn't mind it if it was a little political, but I wanted stuff to make me laugh. Mm -hmm. Like, I was always glued to Dr. Demento when I was a kid, and I would think, why can't these songs always be played? Mm -hmm. It started with the song, Hello, Mata, Hello, Fada, Here I am at Camp Granada. Mm -hmm. And then by the time I heard Dead Skunk in the Middle of the Road, I was like, why can't every song be funny? And they go, oh, those are novelty songs. And I go, well, they're better than a lot of this other music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were funny to me, and they were, it, you know, it's a long line of songs like that to the, the Hanukkah song or whatever. Well, know. it sounds like you, you had a very good childhood, a nice upbringing, very mirthful. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't really have, a, it didn't sound like you had a lot of anger. No, Which no. is where a lot of that punk rock just kind of, that's the nerve that it twists in some people. No, I get it. Yeah, yeah. I totally get it. And then... You know, I got I discovered so much music after that. I don't mean to sound so naive. Like mm. I got totally into pavement, the replacements. I mean, I can talk records all yeah. day long about all that stuff. This is just my journey mm -hmm. started in a way that I think I it was not cool. Mm. <laughs> okay. Well, fair enough. Now, you but you started writing your own songs. Yeah. At what point did you realize you had a gift? I never thought I could write songs. I was always playing guitar and then um, I was always trying to write songs, but mm -hmm. I was trying to write songs as if I was Jackson Brown or James Taylor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to write those songs, and I realized I just I wasn't going to do it, finally. And what happened was, one day I wrote a song called Single Life, and you could hear that song. It's on a Rugburns record called Morning Wood. Mm -hmm. It might even be the opening track. But all I know is when I wrote that song, I teared up. I... I, I I cried when I wrote it. Mm -hmm. And it was like this 
funny, brutally honest song. And I thought it had traces of a little bit of Loudon Wainwright in it, maybe a little bit of the Grateful Dead. And I just, I knew I tapped into something. Was that, was, was that emotional reaction, uh, I guess, happy with yourself? Was it a connection with the song? It was, it was a spiritual connection. And what happened was it was an awakening. And I'll never forget the day I wrote it. I was all alone in my apartment. What I realized was that was the day I really found my voice as a writer. It took me so long to find my voice. And what I mean is not my voice that I sing with, right. but my voice. What you and, wanted to say. Yeah. And I realized, wow, only I can be me. Just like only I, only, I'm the only one who has these fingerprints. My DNA is me, yet I was scared of my own DNA. Mm. I was trying to be somebody else. And when that happened and I wrote Single Life, I was really scared because we had started the Rugburns, but we were just like basically doing Beatles covers and we were just kind of, it was a goof, it was mm. a joke. And so I, I played that song, it was called Single Life, and I remember I did it that night. And on the break, I didn't say I wrote it or anything, and on the break people were coming up going, oh my God, I love that song you played, who wrote that, that's so good. And I went, um, I did. And then people were like, what, you wrote that? And I said, yeah, and that, you need those attaboys to make you continue on. Mm -hmm. And so after I wrote it, I realized, wow, that actually connected with people. Vi I really believe we have vibrations with music and you either like it or you don't. And if you don't, that's fine. Not everybody is, it's another big lesson you learn as a songwriter is you can't get everybody to like you. So mm -hmm. just be you. And the more you can discover that devil may care attitude and be who you're gonna be, that's when you get into the meat of the stuff. And so I wrote that song, and then from then on, I, I became really prolific. It was like, wow, here's my voice. And it was it's always been there with me since. Mm -hmm. So that was 20 years ago, maybe? I would say that was around 1985, okay, 86. Okay. Yeah. And how steady have you written since? Are you a disciplined writer? I mean, do you use it like a muscle? or does your muscle come in spurts? That's a good question. I, I've always said that I feel like it's three muscles. You got your songwriting muscle, and then you have your performance muscle, and you have your recording muscle. And so when you first start recording songs, you don't really know how to do it, and then you learn a few things. That muscle can get stronger if you keep doing it. And then you can just write songs all the time, but if you don't play them, your performance muscle is gonna be really weak. So you'll get up and you won't really be able to mm -hmm. convey what you want to convey to the audience. And you need to get your 10,000 hours in, like Malcolm Gladwell says. So it's like a three-legged stool. Any one it of is. those legs missing? Well, because if you're gonna write the songs, you need to perform them. And if you're gonna perform them, then people wanna buy them, and they want some semblance of what you just did on a recording. Mm -hmm. So it's never gonna be perfect, but yeah, I've always been prolific, and I've put out a lot of records, and I have a lot of songs I still need to record. And I find what works best for me is if I'm in a songwriting group and we have a title or a word that we have to use and deadlines. Mm -hmm. I used to think I'd have to wait till inspiration struck, but I don't believe in that anymore. What it really is is it, if you have deadlines, that's the key. Because deadlines make you keep working, almost like you're a journalist, you're a newspaper man, you have to get that story in, you know, 160 words or whatever, you need to get it in and they're ready for it. So if I have a song that's due, and I'm doing a songwriting game with a group of my peers that I respect, I don't wanna turn in some piece of crap. I wanna turn in something good. And so if you have one song a week due, you're gonna end up with at least 50 songs in a year. And out of those 50, if you cull the herd, and you can end up with even 20% good songs. You have 10 really good songs you're adding. Now that might not sound like a lot, but 10 really good songs to add to your repertoire, it's kind of like compounding interest. Sure. It really grows. Mm -hmm. Now there's been some songwriting games where we did a song every 24 hours, mm. you know? But I find a week is a good amount. And if you really do that, you end up with so many more songs. And then some of the ones that weren't good, you go back and rewrite them and they're actually better than you thought. Mm -hmm. You have all these, as Tom Waits says, you have spare parts like in a junkyard and you go back and steal the spare parts of the songs that weren't used. Mm -hmm. There might be a good verse in there, a couple, good phrase even. Yeah. I learned that from Tom Waits. Wow, okay, so. You, Just so reading you, an interview, I've never met him. Okay, so you've got uh, a group of peers that you work with 
and uh, online, I guess, you're touring around, and once a week you have a deadline. You have an assignment that you signed up for. Yes. What would the brief on that be? Write a song about bananas. Oh, what it'll say is, all you have to do is say the word or words. Okay. So, sewing machine. Mm -hmm. That's this week. Not this week now, but I mean, that's what it would say. It'd say, hey, everybody, the, song, the phrase for this week is sewing machine. Um, next week, Christmas. Next week, raining gravel. Like, somebody will come up with something. Okay. And then... You don't have a list of them for a month. You just have... It, once a week, the Once email a week, comes. yeah. Okay. And then you start working on it, and they say it's due by midnight on Sunday night. And then everybody emails them, and you either listen to people's or you don't. Okay. It's not about a contest. It's about you doing your own work. The discipline. You, nobody might even comment at all on your song for months. Mm -hmm. So it's like... It's not like you're doing it to get attaboys on Facebook, like to get likes or right. comments. If you wanted to, you could put it on Facebook and all your friends are gonna be like, that's so great, you're awesome. This is something where you don't get that praise, mm -hmm. but what you do get is the song. And then if you have the balls to do it, you do it. And I always have something new. Every, wherever I go, I have something new I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the sh I would die on the vine. And I've always been, I'm a really lucky artist in that I'm not tied to hit songs. I'm not like a guy who had a huge hit. I mean, I did through Jewel, but nobody expects to hear that. Mm. So I, I can do, I can always do new songs. People are coming to hear the commentary on the songs, to hear the shows. Of course they have favorite songs, don't get me wrong. Mm. But I'm not so tied to them that that's all I can do. I'm, I'm, I'm always allowed to do some new stuff where a lot of artists can't do that. They got to do the oldie show, like John Fogarty, for instance. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see John Fogarty to hear him do 10 new songs. You're going to be pissed. <laughs> you know, you want to hear <laughs> the Creedence catalog and at yeah. least up to center Fortunate field. Fortunate Son, yeah, up to center field. You want to hear those songs. Right. You'd be pissed. Right. Whereas Dylan does what the hell he wants. You don't even know they're his hits because mm. they're so rewritten. And Neil Young's the same way. He does what he wants. Yeah. And Neil Young's one of my, you know, I look up to him mm -hmm. as somebody that I really um, admire. Same with Ani DeFranco. Okay. You know, somebody who's gone out there and earned it. So if you could look at uh, some folks out there like Neil Young, is that is that the sort of career you want to have? Yeah, I love Neil's career because he does whatever the hell he wants to do. If he wants to make a rock record, he makes a rock record. Um, if he wants to make a country record, he does that. He'll do whatever the hell he wants. Mm -hmm. And I love his career. Um, lately, I've gotten really into the Grateful Dead, and I was never into them. And uh, mm. it's like peeling back layers of an onion now because I'm listening to all these live recordings. And then that led me to all this Jerry Garcia band stuff, his solo stuff, and okay. the stuff he did with Olden and The Way, this bluegrass stuff, and mm -hmm. the stuff he did with Tony Rice. And it was weird because I got really sick two years ago and had a stroke and went blind. And then when my vision came back, I couldn't read, and I was in the hospital. And I didn't think I'd play guitar again. And that was just two years ago, and then I healed from the stroke. I, I didn't even know why I had the stroke. I mm -hmm. had a blood clot in my brain, and you know, I'm lucky I didn't die. And when I got out, I became a deadhead. That, like, things change in the body. Right. It was the weirdest thing. All of a sudden, the Grateful Dead's music made sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> After the stroke. It's really weird, and now I do, like... I have like eight of their songs I know really well, and I'll do a dead song tonight in my show. I don't uh -huh. know which one, but I'm constantly learning a new dead song. Mm. And so that's the other good thing I get to do. I get to do cover songs that I love, like yeah. John Hartford. Uh, I'll do classical guitar pieces because I grew up playing classical guitar. Mm -hmm. So I'll do a classical song. I'll do spoken word. Maybe I'll do a reading from The Godfather 2 mm. where I, I'll do a part by Hyman Roth. Uh, so maybe we'll hear that tonight. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, now, you've been fortunate enough to have some hits that you've yes. written. Specifically, You Were Meant For Me by Jewel. Yes. Um, now, at the time, you were part of the band. You were opening for Jewel, uh, and you'd written the song for Jewel. When did you know that that song started leading to a new level? Well, we co-wrote it together, mm -hmm. and uh, we wrote it in Mexico, and then she got signed to, Mer or to Atlantic Records after that by Danny Goldberg. And so then I still didn't think anything would happen. They listened to all these songs. She had like 300 songs on cassettes. Mm -hmm. So she gave them all to this producer who was Neil Young's 
pedal steel player in the Stray Gators, and his name, he's dead now. He was really cool. Mm. Um, he was so good. Mm-hmm. Anyways, Ben Keith. So Ben Keith passed away, but anyways, he... Neil became a fan of Jules because she got a record deal and they said, why don't you go open for Neil Young? So she opened for Neil Young before her record was out even Mm -hmm. at Madison Square Garden, sold out. And Neil came back into her dressing room. He's like, how you doing, Jewel? And she goes, I'm freaking out. And he goes, why? And she said, "Uh, because I'm opening for Neil Young at Madison Square Garden and it's sold out. And Neil Young goes, ah, it's just another hash house on the road to success. Show them no respect. And then walks out. <laughs> Such good That's advice. Cool. <laughs> so we had written You Were Meant For Me, and they were like, this is a hit. And I was like, that's a hit? And mm-hmm. I was like, wow. So the, the song came out, and nothing happened for nine or ten months. They released it as a single, and the album was going to die at 30,000 copies sold, and that would have been the last you heard of Jewel. And then for some reason they said, you Were Meant For Me needs to be re-recorded by a pop producer. So they got this guy named Peter Collins. Mm. We had already recorded the record. We lived at Neil Young's ranch and made the record up there. Mm. And so they got this Peter Collins guy to redo the song, and he kept my guitar part, but changed everything else and got Flea to play bass on it. Flea, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Red, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Okay. So Flea played, played bass on that hit. And uh, then Jewel re-sang it, and... Then she asked me to be in the video. And this is back when MTV was just like going off. Mm -hmm. And so it was at the end of grunge and everybody was kind of tired of grunge. Like you had Nirvana and then you had um, uh, Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam and all the Seattle bands, you know, it was just like, it was overkill after a while. And then you got the copy bands. like The manufactured bands. Yeah. yeah. Uh Candelabra, Candlebox, (laughs) you know, what they were called. (laughs) But you got all these bands. And then all of a sudden, she was the recipient of good timing because it was like Joan Osborne, um, Edie Brickell. Edie Brickell. Okay. And uh, Paula Cole, Cheryl Crow, mm. Sarah McLaughlin. Okay. Jewel. Jewel was on the cover of Time magazine. Lilith Fair came out. So what happened was they said, We think this song's going to be a hit. You were meant for me. Next thing I know, my dad calls me and he goes, man, your mom and I were watching MTV because our neighbors told us to turn on. That video's being played a lot, Stephen. And I go, it is? And then everybody was like, you're the dude from the Jewel video. That thing became a smash hit. You remember me, it was on the top billboard for like 100 weeks. It broke records. Mm -hmm. So next thing I know, huge checks started coming in the mail and that song was so known. And when I knew it became a hit was one day, I was driving down the road, and there were four girls in a Jeep, and they had it cranked, and they were all singing it. And I pulled up next to them, and I looked at them, and they looked at me. And I go, cool song, huh? Yeah, I wrote it with her, and they go, yeah, right, idiot. And then they drove off, and they were just going, dreams last so long. I was like, but I did. And I went, whoa, and they knew all the words. So that's when I knew. When, that, when the girls pulled up in the car. When they pulled up yeah. in a Jeep and they were in bikinis. <laughs> and they drove away from you. Yeah, and they I've didn't want made it. <laughs> I'm the guy in the video. Don't you recognize me? So you, and, and that song, it still is just such a part of the psyche right now. You could pick out parts of it. Have you heard it in Muzak? Oh, it's in Muzak. This? It's in stores. It's been in that show, The Office, with mm. Steve Carell. Right. Right. Insane. <laughs> in The Office. Can you believe this? No, I mean, I, it's probably in movies. Now, if if James Cameron wanted to use it in a movie or something, do you get a phone call, or is there just a machine that, uh, you know, takes care of it and sorts all that out, and you just see the, the back end of it? I hope he would use it for yeah. somebody big. I could, You know where I could see it being used in the future is, like, some Will Ferrell movie where he's drunk and he sings karaoke to it. You know what I mean? Like, where he's like, and everybody's like, ah, remember that song? Because everybody knows it. It's in yeah. our DNA. Yeah. And I could see Will Carroll like, Will Ferrell, I yeah. mean. Will Ferrell being really drunk, maybe running down the street naked. Without a shirt singing. on. Yeah, yeah, without a shirt on. Dreams of, with those man boots. So yeah. long, even after you're gone. Like, I could see it being used like mm-hmm. that, and I'll be happy if that happens. But no, I don't think I'd even get a... I think people would let me know that it happened. So I was the recipient of good timing, as, as mm-hmm. was Jewel. 
And the fact that I co-wrote that with her and it sold, I think it sold 15 million records. The checks were huge that came in. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know what I did with the money. Mm. Those were the wild years. (laughs) But it must have been fun, yeah? It was awesome, yeah. (laughs) And there were other things that happened. Like I had a song that I wrote with another girlfriend named Anya Marina. And that got used in a G-pad, a huge G-pad during the World Series. Mm -hmm. And then I had a song on the soundtrack to Notting Hill song on the soundtrack to Jack Frost that gets played every Christmas Mm -hmm. so those are like those are mailbox money gifts that keep giving but I never really cared about I never tried to do it Mm -hmm. I just I really feel like I don't know I was in the right place at the right time and I'm nothing has changed in my life I'm still doing what you're still doing doing the work yeah you're still still loading in you saw me I just sound checked and it's not yeah it's not like you've stopped it's not like you said that was my goal and I've made it it's like okay well yeah it's it's a bit of luck. If you're gonna if you're gonna write a thousand songs, maybe one will hit. Yeah, it was good that you got it early because it allowed you the freedom and the ability to do other things. It did. But you're still doing the work. Yeah. You're and what up. was cool? Yeah, I'm out here every day doing it, and I could win the lottery tomorrow, and I would still I wouldn't change anything. I'd still be doing this. Mm-hmm. I don't need things. I have a guitar. Mm-hmm. I have a good pair of jeans. I have good shoes. I travel with only like one or two pairs of jeans and one pair of shoes, a couple shirts. The rest is merch I sell. It's like a game to me. Mm-hmm. You know, like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak started Apple Computer. It was a game to them when it started building it in their garage to see what they could do. Mm -hmm. It's a game to me to build it, and every year it gets a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I'm the tortoise and the hare. (laughs) And it just slowly, I chug along, and now... Well, you gotta be patient. Uh, I mean, when things happen overnight, they go away just as easily overnight. Yes. Here you got, you got, you're gonna do a show tonight for how many hundred people? Yeah. And then next year you'll be here, it'll be that many people plus another 50. Yeah. Like last night, two nights ago, it sold out at the Camelot. They turned people away. Last night, I did Could You Diggers. Mm-hmm. Melbourne shows, I'm doing five now in Melbourne in different mm-hmm. venues. They sell out or come close to it. And <clears throat> I get to travel and I get to do this. And I keep wanting to go to new areas and keep doing it. And it's like I'm the luckiest guy in the world that I get to do <laughs> this. Because when you're really doing what you love, it's not about the money. The money is nice. Well, what it's really about is about doing what you love and finding what it is that makes your spirit happy. Mm. And it's always been music for me, man. I couldn't have picked a better job. I will do this when I'm 80. Like, Willie Nelson's still doing it. Why can't I? Sure. So with the new year coming on, what are you going to do in 2017? Well, I think for the first time I won't be in Australia for a full year because mm. – I've been here twice this year, so I think I'll come back in 2018 and do Port Ferry, do Blues Fest, hopefully, if I get that one. I'll definitely do Blue Mountain Festival, and I'll do Nan Up in West Australia and play a bunch of shows. But maybe I'll come back to Australia. You never know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like it. I could even come back for a week and just do a couple Mm -hmm. one-offs. But I got a bunch of – since I've met you, which I met you a long time ago, Mm -hmm. I wasn't in the festival circuit yet. Mm. And – now I'm in the festival circuit in the States, Canada, and Australia, and that's been a game changer for me because when you're in the festival circuit, you get exposed to sometimes two to 3,000 people in a tent that you're playing music for that are there for the festival, not there to see you, but they happen to come by, and if you can convert them, they become mm-hmm. fans of yours, and that really makes your following grow. And then the other thing is just, the, to quote Malcolm Gladwell again, the tipping point. Mm-hmm. Things start happening, you keep doing it, and if you do it long enough, somebody's finally going to go, you know, I've heard about this, and I get this all the time. I have heard your name for years. I finally came in, mm-hmm. and I won't be back. <laughs> <laughs> the first song, I hated you. Yeah. <laughs> the second song, I really hated you. But, yeah, eventually you, you turn those people, and, yeah, they become loyal. So totally. That's great. Would you be up for playing a song? Sure. Thanks. <laughs> This is how I made it. Everything in this song's true. 
You be pissing in a bottle and you can't see through the fog, you know, a truck a jack knifed in the snow up ahead for show. Raid, I got you clocked at 87 and a 55. Cops, I want to search your car because they think you're high. Finally reached the club and they got no posters up. Play to 12 people, half a puking in a cup. Sell two CDs, give another six away. You're hoping that somebody is a place where you could stay. You got a 10 hour drive in the morning. Don't swear to keep think about the gig last night. You wish you could forget it. Listen to a podcast, a radio lab, try to call your mom but end up yelling at your dad, car needs gas so you're pulling to the come and go, the weather channel says that you're about to hit some snow, sell one CD, give another eight away to add insult to injury, you had to pay to play cause you're a folk singer, folk folk singer, you're a washed up punk, still a dead ringer for a folk singer, you're a folk folk singer for sure. Get a big break and get to do some radio But the DJ says it's taped for next week's show Does you no good cause tonight you got the gig You keep on smiling and dance a little jig Car starts whining and the engine's running hot Gas station dude says your radiator's shot Sell 12 CDs, give none away But the radiator took it all, it's Groundhog Day Yo folk singer, folk folk singer Yo a washed up club Still a dead ringer for a folk singer, for a folk folk singer for show. The club owner says you should have played here last week. Cause right now it's finals and no one makes a peep. He wishes that the money could have been a lot more. But the deal was only for a small percentage of the door. $27 in a couple foreign bills. Tried to pass a hat, but everyone was high on pills. Play a new song, no applause, just crickets. Bartender says I'll give you two drink tickets. Yo, folk singer, folk, folk singer. Yo, a washed up punk. Still a dead ringer for a folk singer. Yo, a folk, folk singer for show. You get a good offer for a gig in Atlanta, but the airlines send your guitar all the way to Montana. Get a real person on the phone from United, lose your cool, tell the dude to go bite it. Borrow a guitar to try to cool your rage. Walk into the club and someone else is on stage. Sell no CDs, the club is double booked, you never even got to play, you feel your life is overlooked. Folk singer, folk, folk singer, yo, a washed up punk. Still a dead ringer for a folk singer, yo, a folk, folk singer for show. Finally get some sleep and there's a nice blue sky And the airlines found your guitar all the way in Dubai Say that it'll be there for your gig in Tallahassee But you ate some bad food, feeling kinda gassy Get a Motel 6, wish it was the Ritz At least you got a private place because you got the shit Sell five hats, two CDs Yes sir, no ma'am, thank you please Folk singer, folk, folk singer Yo, a washed up punk Still a dead ringer, yo a folk singer, yo a folk folk singer for show. Your manager grabs you right before you play your show and says, I think that you should dye your hair because it's white as snow. Girlfriend calls you as you leave the stage. She saw a picture of you with a chick and now she's in a rage. Break up, break down, break it all to hell. Charging all the damage to your hotel bill. Sell five stickers for 50 cents. Yo, a folk singer now, yo, about to make a dent. Finally get some good news from the booking agent dude at the club tonight. They'll give you half off on your food. Place is packed, gonna make you fee, but they wouldn't even turn off the sports TV. Feel like you climbed another rung on the ladder. Yo, another day older, another day fatter. I'm a folk singer now in the pale moon. Like That's how I'm going to be standing on stage at the basement in Circular Key in Sydney, Australia tonight. Because I'm a folk singer, folk, folk singer, I'm a washed up punk, still a dead ringer, I'm a folk singer, I'm a folk, folk singer for show. I'm a folkity folk folker, I'm a Bram Stoker joker, I'm a vampire smoker, I'm a motherfucking folker today. Yes, that was great. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Steve Poltz. Make sure you check out him at his website, poltz.com, P-O-L-T-Z. 
or P-O-L-T-Z, depending on which continent you live into. Uh, make sure to check out his tour dates. If he's coming around your town, make sure you go see him, support him. It's a fantastic show. Always has. This is now my probably sixth or seventh time seeing you live. Yes. It's always great. It's always fantastic. Pick up uh, some of his CDs, some of his records, at uh, and some of his hats, and maybe some <laughs> 50 cent stickers yes. at Pulse.com. Steve, thank you very much. much thank you it. so much. This was awesome. All good.